Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. Liquidware, the innovator in adaptive workspace management solutions. And also brought to you by Policy Pack Software, now part of Netrix, where you use group policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And of course, also brought to you by ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work-from-anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. ZDNet reported this week that Microsoft are preparing to make Windows 10 21H2 available in November. Customers can expect this to be a relatively minor update. ZDNet stated that earlier this year, Microsoft officials said that this release would feature WPA3 H2E standard support for enhanced Wi-Fi security, Windows Hello for business support for simplified passwordless deployment models for achieving a deploy to run state within a few minutes, and also GPU compute support in the Windows subsystem for Linux and Azure IoT Edge for Linux on Windows deployments for machine learning and other compute intensive workflows. So while they had suggested that earlier this year, it appears that the new Windows Hello for Business deployment method is still not ready and will instead be delivered in a future monthly update for those who opt to go with 21H2. The report states that Microsoft officials have declined to say whether or not Microsoft plans to continue to make two feature updates per year for Windows 10 after 21H2. All they've publicly stated is that Microsoft will support Windows 10 until October 2025 with security updates and fixes. The Verge had a really interesting article this week that included some comments from a former Microsoft F Sharp developer that helped hammer the overall point home, but essentially the article states that a hot reload feature, which is a feature that essentially allows developers to get instant feedback when they're creating a project and change code to immediately see results. The article stated that it's a big selling point for Google's rival DAR programming language and Flutter toolkit. And Microsoft has been playing catch up to bring that kind of feature to .NET and Visual Studio. And this kind of feature was expected to be available to developers across all platforms via .NET 6, but Microsoft have decided to strip out their one to 2000 lines of code for the feature for the official release due to an issue of priority. The feature will only be available in the full Visual Studio 2022 release, which obviously raises some eyebrows. It tells developers if they want the best experience for developing, they need to pay for Visual Studio. Philip Carter was the former Microsoft employee on the company's F Sharp team, and in a comment on, and he commented on Microsoft's blog posts, quote, this is a clear backslide, especially because Hot Reload did not start out as being only for Visual Studio. I really hope this isn't the start of a pattern, end quote. And now some of the social media discussion on this topic and also the headline of the article suggests that oh look microsoft we're going this direction of embracing open source and now they're pulling back and um, starting to upsell their wares again but i guess we're going to have to wait and see if this is an exception to the rule or if this is going to become the rule again windows terminal 1.12 preview release has now been made available It includes some new features, including the fact that you can now set the Windows Terminal Stable build as your default terminal emulator if you're on the Windows Insider Program dev channel or Windows 11. And this means when you launch any command line application, it will automatically launch inside the Windows Terminal. You can enable Windows Terminal as your default experience by using Windows Settings app or inside Windows Terminal settings itself. Windows Terminal will now appropriately handle matching the executable launched with its terminal profile. So this means that all of your customizations will appear if you have a profile with the same executable as the one selected to launch. So for example, when clicking the command prompt from the star menu, it will open your command prompt profile 
rather than just like the regular black screen cmd.exe. This feature is only available in the Windows Terminal Preview and will move into the Windows Terminal release in future. You can now set your Windows Terminal to restore your previous tabs and panes after relaunching. Awesome. Windows Terminal now supports full transparency on Windows 11. So instead of using the acrylic look, you can have full transparency just like the transparency variation available in the original console. So more like that terminal console that you see a lot of developers using who prefer Linux. There are also some other maybe less prominently mentioned features like elevated terminal windows will now display a shield icon to the left of the tabs to make the window more distinguishable and there's more plus bug fixes. I'll share a link to everything that's included in this release with this episode, which is episode 200, and you'll find that on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links for this episode. A new version of the remote desktop client by Microsoft has been released. This is version 1.2.2600. It includes updates to Teams for Azure Virtual Desktop, including improvements to camera performance during video calls, and improved client logging, diagnostics, and error classification to help admins troubleshoot connection and feed issues. A popular library, the UA Parser JS library, which is used to parse a browser's user agent to identify a visitor's browser, engine, OS, CPU, and device type model, was hijacked to infect Linux and Windows devices with crypto miners and password stealing Trojans in a supply chain attack. A developer claimed that his NPM account was hijacked and used to deploy three malicious versions of the library. And due to the widespread impact of this supply chain attack, it is strongly advised that all users of the UA Parser JS library check their projects for malicious software. This includes checking for the existence of either jsextension.exe for Windows or jsextension on Linux and deleting them if they are found. And for Windows users, you should scan your device for a create.dll file and delete it immediately. While only Windows was infected with a password stealing Trojan, it is wise for Linux users to also assume their device was fully compromised. And due to this, all infected Windows and Windows users should also change their passwords, keys, and refresh tokens as they were likely compromised and sent to the threat actor. The Azure Spot Virtual Machines Try to Restore functionality is now generally available. Some of the benefits of this functionality includes It will attempt to restore Azure Spot Virtual Machines that are evicted due to capacity issues. Restored Azure Spot Virtual Machines are expected to run for a longer duration with a lower probability of capacity triggered eviction. Improves the lifespan of an Azure Spot Virtual Machine so workloads run for a longer duration and also helps virtual machine scale sets to maintain the target count for Azure Spot Virtual Machines, similar to maintain target count feature that already exists for the pay-as-you-go VMs. They warn that the try to restore feature is disabled in scale sets that use auto scale, and the number of VMs in the scale set is driven by the auto scale rules too. A high severity security flaw was found in WordPress plugins with more than 8,000 active installs that can let authenticated attackers reset and wipe vulnerable websites. The plugin in question is known as Hash Themes Demo Importer, and it's designed to help admins import demos for WordPress themes with a single, without dealing with installing any dependencies. Bleepitcomputer.com reports the security bug would allow authenticated attackers to reset WordPress sites and delete almost all database content and uploaded media. While the vulnerability was initially reported on August 25th, 2021, the developers did not reply to the disclosure messages for almost a month. This prompted researchers to reach out to the WordPress plugin team on September 20th, which led to the plugin's removal the same day and the release of a patch addressing the bug four days later on September 24th. This, of course, is one of many, frankly, security vulnerabilities related to WordPress and 
WordPress plugins. The price of convenience, I guess. There was an interesting tweet from Jonathan Petre this week who tweeted, is it just me or are OneDrive files on demand no longer working with server 2019, he asks. I can't help but notice that Microsoft patched the files on demand driver with the latest October 12th update. He also warned that even after uninstalling the latest patch, the problems persisted. So be wary if you're installing patches on server 2019 and you're using OneDrive files on demand, proceed with caution. I mean, you should always proceed with caution when patching, but maybe be extra cautious. Laura Cochranen tweeted this week that she noticed that you can now make requests to Microsoft Graph with delegated permissions with a non-premium Power Automate action and don't need to set up an Azure Active Directory app registration or create a custom connector. You just simply sign in as usual and craft the request, which I thought that was newsworthy because I tried this with Power Automate I think about two months ago and I thought the process was pretty painful so Nice to see that it's been streamlined. A call has gone out for speakers for the festive tech calendar event. If you've got a session in you, submit to contribute a session someday in December. So it's kind of like a festive or tech advent calendar. So it's going to run through, I assume, the first 24 days of December, just like an advent calendar might. And there'll be a session every day. And for this year's festive tech calendar, They've introduced a new concept of being a site supporter. So if you're working at a vendor or maybe you're even a blogger and you want to get some promotion for yourself, they're welcoming individuals or companies who would like to run a competition or similar, and you can give out prizes as part of the festive tech calendar. So you're not necessarily a sponsor, but you're running a competition and you can associate or maybe piggyback off the event for your competition. If you would like to do something like that and to get a shout out or have your company run a competition as part of the event, reach out to Gregor Sutty via Twitter if you have any questions. And I'll share a link with this episode so you can read more about it and also reach out if you're interested. Also, if you listen to this episode before Friday, Microsoft are hosting a sweepstakes to celebrate the 25th anniversary of SysInternals. One lucky winner will receive a 30-minute mentoring session with Microsoft Azure CTO and SysInternals creator, Mark Rosinovic. To enter, all you have to do is post a video or text-based story on on Twitter or LinkedIn with the hashtag SysInternalsStorySweepstakes or as a reply to their blog post talking about your favorite SysInternals tool. Speaking of anniversaries, this week marked the 20th anniversary of Windows XP and the 12th anniversary of Windows 7. And between the two of them, there is a worrying number of machines around the world still using these operating systems. And with that, let's talk about a weekly webinar. The webinar or series of webinars that I'd like to highlight on this week's episode is Microsoft Ignite, which will be taking place from November 2nd through 4th, starting at 8.15 a.m. Pacific with a keynote, live segments, breakouts, Ask the Experts product roundtables, learning sessions, and more. So register if you'd like to join that. It is online again. And now a hot job. This week I saw a job with Recon that's for a security systems administrator, a full-time role with a salary of $70,000 to $95,000 a year. I thought it was interesting because it says, are you in IT and looking to move into InfoSec? Then this is the perfect position for you. So if you've been working in IT and you've been looking for an opportunity to maybe branch out into InfoSec, this could be a really great opportunity. They say they're looking for a seasoned systems or network administrator to oversee their network defense range, as well as their internal systems and applications. Job responsibilities would include support recon internal systems and applications, work with internal DevOps teams to monitor and troubleshoot production security systems, and work with the range team to deploy, maintain, configure, and upgrade range environment systems. 
Skills and requirements include troubleshoot networks, experience with Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, critical thinking and analytical skills, consult with other engineers in productive open team environment, have a two to five year hands-on systems admin with increasing levels of responsibility and experience, be a US citizen, be able to pass a background check, available as needed on call, and more. They also mentioned that competitive applicants will have previous experience with administration of Okta, Google Workspace, VMware, Active Directory, Exchange, MDM, experience with tools such as Sysmon, ELK, Velociraptor, and EDR, and a breadth of knowledge with a willingness to deep dive into unfamiliar technologies. So again, maybe a great opportunity if you're looking to branch out into InfoSec. This one could be for you. Um, unfortunately, it's for U.S. citizens only. So, hey, for my American listeners, check it out. And now some scripts, tricks, and tips. This week, my colleagues, Dr. Benny Trish and Marcel Calif, published an interview session going through Control Up's Ultimate Lab series, which essentially talking to techies about their lab environments. And this is gonna be the first in a series, I believe. And Marcel goes through talking about the Acme lab that he has built and has also been caring for too. It's a pretty impressive lab. And I think this is a really good idea for a series because a lot of us have home labs. We could probably take away some inspiration from each other. And even though this isn't necessarily a home lab, it's also cool to see a lab at such large scale from time to time too. And I have been told as well, there's going to be some smaller scale labs as well that uh, meet the requirement of being spouse acceptable. So (laughs) not taking up a lot of space and not being overly loud. So watch the first episode and be sure to check out the future episodes too. And speaking of labs, this week, the Citrix Community Lab Pilot Program was unveiled. Citrix are inviting applicants until Tuesday, November 30th, and they're going to draw 100 participants at random from the pool of applicants in early December, and then let you know your selection status by Friday, December 10th to get a community lab. This has been a long time in the making and just sorely needed. I hope this is something they're going to expand on for just all enthusiasts. I saw a really cool tool called the Cloud Comparer by Elias, who goes by Elias-IT83 on GitHub, but it was actually shared on Twitter by Paige Bailey. And it essentially is a web tool now. It was originally a generated document, I believe, but it's a web tool that allows you to compare different public cloud offerings on a feature-by-feature basis. So very cool stuff. James Rankin shared a pretty interesting and high-level video this week on his favorite Windows 10 keyboard shortcuts. It's kind of a departure from his very lengthy, deeply technical blog posts, but it certainly serves a purpose and will be interesting to a much wider audience, so pretty cool stuff. This week I read a blog post on how to create and register an application within an Azure portal and how to backdoor the application, as well as how to detect a backdoored application. So if you're working with Azure Active Directory and Microsoft 365, and you're interested in the security side of things and maybe reverse engineering and understanding and understanding some of the nitty gritty, this is a really great blog post to read. I also read a blog post on blog.itprocloud.de on the secret about disappearing AppX and UWP applications in an environment using FSLogix. So the highlight, I guess, or the synopsis here is that some users install applications from the Windows Store, and if the user logs off at the end of the day and logs in the next day, the applications are mysteriously gone, and only a dead item or, I guess, icon is left behind in the start menu. The users have to install the applications over again from the Windows Store. Now it's pointed out that the application settings are persisting in the user profile. So once the application is installed, they still have their settings and everything they need. And the blog post goes into what's the cause and 
provides a lot of detail around it. I'm not going to give away the contents. I just wanted to highlight it and point you toward it. Peter Veglevin shared a really handy, well, it could be a life hack really, or a tip. But you can make the in-flight Wi-Fi think you're using an iPhone instead of a PC and get your one hour free T-Mobile option. So if you're flying in the States, I think it's with American Airlines where they give T-Mobile customers some like free in-flight Wi-Fi. Well, if you don't have a T-Mobile phone and you want to trick it with your PC, it's possible. So <laughs> that's going to be handy for me. Pretty cool. And finally, I mentioned on last week's episode, but the second ever Cloud Paging User Group meetup is going to be taking place online on November 5th, which is next Friday at 2.30 GMT until 4 p.m. We're going to discuss different methods or ways of deploying Cloud Paging applications and environments, as well as discuss some of the details around a free Cloud Paging training that we're gonna be offering starting November 12th. So if you wanna hear all about all that, make sure to register and I'll share a link with this episode so you can register for free today. Well, it is the 200th episode and I didn't really wanna make a big deal out of it, but I would mention that, hey, if you've been listening to all 200 episodes or maybe even just some of the episodes and you enjoy them, I'd appreciate it if you could go to your podcast platform of choice, maybe Apple Podcasts or whatever you use, and just leave a rating for the podcast. It helps push it up and promote the podcast and get more ears and maybe eyes on the YouTube channel and just more recognition. So I'd appreciate that. And thank you all so much for listening and I'll catch you next week.